still coming late. Uh, I suggest nevertheless that we are starting now. Uh, I mean, given that Jonathan will arrive um, in time, then uh, we have three papers, which means three papers and 90 minutes time. Uh, so we have 30 minutes per each. I suggest that we have 20 minutes presentation maximum and then uh, 10 minutes for question and answers. Richard, would you like to take over? Yeah, thank you, Dieter. Um, yes, uh, well, of course, my, our presentation will be then be divided in, uh, in two parts again, 10 minutes it, each for, for myself and, um, and Jose. Um, so let me first start my, share my screen. You should be able to see my screen now. Um, yeah, so um, I'm uh, currently in London, unfortunately. I, I mean, of course, I had hoped to be in Utrecht, but my co-presenter is actually one of the few people who is in, uh, in, uh, in Utrecht because he is uh, um, uh, leading the Digital Humanities Lab at the University of Utrecht. Um, so we, um, we are going to present a project on which we have been working um, for a while now. And uh, the name of the project is uh, On Track, and it's of course an acronym. And this acronym stands for uh, an online tool for recording and analyzing quotation histories. Um, so, um, what we will be presenting, uh, especially in about uh, 10 minutes' time, uh, is merely a pilot for this tool, a an, an, an very early version. Um, but this pilot was uh, funded um, by the HCS, uh, their new initiatives fund. Uh, early this year, we were awarded a grant for which we are very helpful uh, because we, it allowed us to, to start this project. Um, I will first explain why, what, what the reason is, why, why I thought such a tool would be a useful tool uh, once it works uh, uh, well. And uh, Jose will then be called upon to explain the how. Um, so now, okay, so just uh, first uh, uh, a little bit about why I think quotation history is something that would be a useful thing uh, to engage in. I think that uh, you may have uh, had the same feeling as me um, sometimes, uh, the uh, vague or, or very uh, uh, acute awareness that actually the, uh, uh, the literature that we can call economic, and of course, you know, uh, the boundaries are uh, vague, but um, uh, the, the kind of sources that we uh, could be using uh, as object of study is actually uh, enormous in quantity, at least uh, since the 18th century. Um, if you uh, look at, uh, this is Hansen's bibliography of 1963, just for uh, Britain and actually Ireland as well, uh, just for the 50 years of the, the first 50 years of the 18th century, he lists 6,500 new publications. And, uh, and Higgs, uh, the probably uh, more well-known, uh, his bibliography, uh, of course, covering more than just Britain, but um, lists 6,700 works. Yeah? And, um, and of course, nowadays, we don't really have to necessarily look in those bibliographies anymore because a lot of these texts have started to make an appearance online. Yeah, we, uh, we all know uh, Google Books and uh, various other depositories of uh, digital versions of uh, many texts. But it has always been the case uh, previously that uh, the historiography of economics has of necessity been highly selective. There's nothing wrong with this, obviously, because uh, whatever criteria you use, um, a, a lot of the stuff that you come across will not be interested in uh, uh, you know, judging by the criteria that you're using. Uh, but I think it's important to realize um, that uh, a selection always is done on particular criteria, obviously, 
And, uh, and by far, I'm actually uh, almost all the historiography has been based on criteria of significance, which of course were defined and uh, obviously by the historians, the historians themselves, yeah, based on their particular uh, analytical, ideological, thematic, uh, and various other preoccupations, they will have made selections and uh, given particular significance to particular contributions. And what is important to, I think, to note is that I'm not having a go here. Uh, uh, it's uh, unavoidable, as I always said. Uh, and also, I've, I'm not talking about any particular, um, shall we say, uh, style of historiography. Yeah? So it is true for uh, uh, the, our beloved uh, um, Jupiter, uh, of course, you know, uh, a very, very rich work, but also a very selective and very het uh, retrospective selection of uh, you know, what he feels are the most important contributions to the analytical progress that economic analysis has, has taken. Yeah? And, and he comes up with these interesting uh, expressions as like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm picking on strong and Richard, are you still with us? It sounds that uh, it feels like I've dropped out, is that correct? Yes. Can you hear me now again? Yes. Ah, sorry about that. I don't know. Uh, I've moved to another place of my house, but may have a more reliable internet connection. Um, okay, so, but this is of course also true even when you talk about, you know, the more modern, more contextualized intellectual history, uh, 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 you know, treatments of history of economic thought, still obviously uh, highly selective uh, selections of, uh, of works. Now, maybe you wonder, you know, is this not unavoidable? This is something also uh, was wondered by um, an interesting historian of economic thought, uh, Julian Hoppet, uh, and he actually, um, in, a, in an, uh, an article from 2006, says, well, what if we try to assign significance on the basis of the dissemination at the time of particular texts? Yeah, so try to do something which is um, not defined initially by the historian uh, in terms of uh, significance, in terms of content. So he comes up with a few ways of doing this. Um, so, for example, and that is what he does actually in his article, he says, well, let's look at the frequency with which particular texts uh, appear in the libraries uh, of a period. Yeah? So you look simply if particular works um, uh, appear a lot uh, in libraries, and from that you can uh, um, allocate significance. So, for example, uh, Joshua Child and Matthew Decker appear apparently were the most appearing um, books in libraries, and uh, and you don't have to make a judgment then whether those people were significant or not uh, in terms of um, particular ideas that they had, but they simply by their frequency of occurrence. Um, are selected uh, for study. Uh, other approaches could be something that, uh, and that's also mentioned by her, but by actually done by Reinert, uh, so it was Reinert in 2018, uh, making a list of bestsellers. Yeah? So how many times were they reissued, re-edited, reprinted and translated particular text? And that may give you an, a way of selecting for, well, significance particular text. Another thing that was mentioned by uh, Hoppet, um, but not attempted, is uh, how many references are there by contemporaries to a particular text. Actually, that was an, an approach that I found most promising. 
uh, in a previous paper, I've uh, tried to uh, do something on, along these lines. And my argument was there that the main promise of this third approach is that it would yield more detailed insights, not only into which authors were quoted most, but when uh, and when in, or in what language, but also the specific topics on which and the context in which they were quoted. You know? So we would expect Adam Smith to be quoted quite often, but what particular passages, what particular ideas in what times exercised some influence or influence at least were close, uh, uh, quoted. Um, now I've also pointed out at that time already that that of course is desirable but it is very difficult to construct a quotation history of that kind. Um, it would be effortful and uh, especially if you want to make a reasonable claim to be systematic and, and representative for a period as a whole. Um, at the time, I was trying to do something more modest, so I was looking uh, at somebody who had done the work, work for me already, so to say, in the 18th century. Um, Malachi Postlethwaite's Universal Dictionary I used, and uh, he made an enormous compilation of what he thought were authorities in his time, and I mapped the various cross-references in the uh, dictionary. Uh, in order to then uh, define particular subject areas and then to find which authors were most quoted on those subject areas. And that would be a way of trying to, astore, uh, to, to, to assign significance again to particular authors. Uh, the more ambitious uh, idea of um, uh, uh, an, an, a wider attempt at quotation history is the one that this current project hopes to contribute to. So we need a tool uh, that would allow one to link many digital versions, of course, of texts through quotations, reference, and mentions between them. And that was the idea. This is not so easy, and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, Jose will uh, tell you this, um, especially because the earlier literature the way it's formatted, this can, can't be done, done automatically, these links. Also, of course, different citation practices existed. So this will be a, uh, a difficult task, which would require a collaborative effort. Um, so therefore, a collaborative tool that allows users to add further links between texts. And uh, then subsequently, of course, the, generated links are data that can then be used for further analysis. I'm gonna hand over to Jose in a moment for her to give you an impression of what it looks like at the moment. But uh, before I do that, a little bit of a, uh, trying to preempt some possible criticism. Um, yeah. Of course, it would merely be an aid to writing histories. Yeah? So um, having evidence of quotation, and link quotations does avoid some kind of interpretations and influences yeah, uh, that, uh, that, of course, need to be discussed with by historians. Yeah? So, um, what the history of economic uh, um, thought will remain, of course, is turning data into narratives. Uh, but the idea would be to have a starting point which is uh, more objective and, and not retrospective in terms of uh, selecting your sources. Okay, I'm uh, going to stop my sharing now and um, we'll hand over to Jose. Thank you very much, Richard. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um... Well, my name is Jose de Kruijf. You do not know me, uh, most of you, I think, uh, uh, you have not met before. So I'll do a very brief introduction. Uh, I'm a historian. Uh, I did a master in social and economic history long ago, you can tell. Um, and uh, I did a, a PhD in cultural history and I'm a digital humanities specialist. And as such, I'm the team leader of the Digital Humanities uh, Lab at Utrecht University. And uh, we build uh, tools and we hand advice uh, on the digital humanities uh, for 
researchers. So I'll start to, to share my screen now to uh, see if I can. Yes, here it is. I will give a short demonstration now of the tool uh, that we uh, built. Uh, it's the practical implementation of the research that Richard just set out. It's a collaborative web-based uh, tool, and it's, uh, we hope it will be suited to map the quotation histories of the text that are uh, uh, added to it. Uh, like uh, Richard, I'm very grateful for the grant that was generously given by the society and that enabled us, uh, the Digital Humanities Lab, to build this prototype because I feel this experiment is worth our while. Uh, firstly, because uh, thanks to the large scale digitization of historical texts, there are many online collections that we could use. And secondly, because uh, thanks to the developments in digital humanities and more especially text mining, there's an abundance of toolage available uh, to support researchers in the analysis. It is really a great leap forward. Um, our tool uh, enables us to connect passages in texts and thus to connect ideas in the history of economics, or at least we hope it will do that. I will now log in. The tool has a login so that we can monitor who is adding what. Oh my. Here we are. Um, the user can uh, search uh, the documents uh, that are uh, loaded. Uh, at the moment for the demonstration, there's just uh, six of them. But uh, of course, there will be uh, many more in the, in the future. Uh, it's possible to search uh, full text over here in, in all the documents. And it's possible to filter documents uh, on the basis of the metadata. Uh, like uh, the type of publication, uh, the language, we have one French example. Okay, here we are. To you. Um, uh, to be able to annotate, uh, two uh, documents must be uh, opened. I will uh, start with uh, Adam Smith, an inquiry into the nature and causes and etc. And if I want to annotate, I click over here. And you can see it is a uh, Gutenberg free of copyright and very clean, very nice. So I can scroll through the document and I now should be able Well, normally uh, it would show uh, annotations that are already there. But in the Zoom session, it, uh, the screens are different. So I apologize. I will load the second doc document. Malthus essay on the principle of population. It's really slow. Don't worry, if this doesn't work out and the server is out of order, I will show you a movie. You will have your demo, whatever happens.
Okay, I'll stop sharing for now because this is taking too long and this is not the normal behavior of the of the server. And I will try just a moment. I also have to apologize, but your 20 minutes are running out. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll go on then without uh, showing. Um, I'm very sorry. Um, what happens is that uh, I select a second document normally, and I will be able to uh, highlight passages, snippets of text in both documents and create a link between them. And um, uh, on top of the requirements that you have to consider with regard to how the tool works in practice, uh, conceptual problems that are inherent in this research also creep into the design of the tool. Because what do we actually consider to be a citation within this application? Well, we have decided to take this broadly. So a citation is a conceptual directional link uh, from um, a citing entity to another citing, from a citing entity, sorry, to a, a, to a cited entity. And inclusion of a formal bibliographic reference is not possible in the early modern age, uh, because these are historical sources, of, of course, uh, and they do not always have such formal references. Uh, then uh, it is possible in the tool uh, to indicate the nature of the collect of, of the connection in a selection menu. And our citations can have the following types, maybe related, plagiarizes, is plagiarized by, cites as authority, is cited as authority by, includes quotation from or is quoted by. And these characterizations are derived from CITO, a citation typing ontology. And if anybody wants uh, or, or is interested, I can send the link afterward. And then the user can add uh, uh, a comment to the annotation if needed. And if not correct, uh, uh, annotations can also deleted, be deleted afterward. And this way we gradually hope to build a history of quotations. Finally, the applied links can be export it as a CSV file. Can you see my screen? Ik laat hem nu even zien. Kan je hem niet zien, Richard? De hele boel loopt vast. Kan je hem niet zien? Ja, oké. Ja? Hardly. However, I really have to insist that the time is out now. Oké. I will send. I will show a final screen. This is what we aim for, in the long run, uh, to have uh, to be able to analyze and to have uh, a, a visual uh, uh, displays of quotations like this, uh, and expand the tool with, uh, for instance, pre annotations uh, on the basis of automated rec automated recognition. Okay. Thank you for your patience, and I'm very sorry. My computer behaves this way. It is not very convincing. I realize that. Okay, thank you so much for presentation. Now it's uh, still um, room for about six, eight minutes question and answers. Well, that sounds like an opportunity to me to for Jose to say something more. Um, well, I'm I'm in big trouble here. I can see oh. only one picture, and my Zoom is uh, okay. refusing. This is really all going wrong. I will uh, anyway. I will try to. To, uh, 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 one of my questions is if there's a possibility uh, to send in uh, 
a movie of a few minutes with a live de demonstration of the tools uh, afterwards for the uh, Congress. Uh, I'm afraid that the internet is not so well, then you won't succeed very good. Uh, but you can send, you can put any link into the chat folder. Okay, I will, I will uh, put uh, put the demonstration online later on, okay. and uh, uh, show you the link. And now we have on the last minute. We have two questions: Mary Morgan and Aurelian Goodmit. Uh, in that order, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. This um, sounds like a really great project. and I'm really pleased to hear about it. I unfortunately missed the first couple of minutes. Um, so maybe you already answered my question, but can you sketch in the ambition of the whole? Because um, it seems like it could go on. <laughs> it could just expand <laughs> and expand. And so um, is there a kind of particular ambition that you're trying to circulate? And I apologize if I missed the answer to this. Well, maybe I can answer that question. Uh, the ambition uh, is the, uh, indeed to act, to have it as completely open ended, uh, having it expanding uh, as we go along. Sort of uh, as people uh, find uh, work through a particular text and want to add links. Um, uh, uh, along with that, we would want to load up more texts and. Um, and, and made the network bigger, so to say. Uh, of course, we would initially start with a good number of texts already uh, loaded in, but uh, hopefully, and of course, it, uh, this depends on uh, further money being available and, uh, and technological uh, progress being made by the developers. Um, uh, we, idea, the idea is to have it as a collaborative tool in which uh, many people could uh, work and add their particular, you know, links for their particular um, favorite authors, so to say. Thank you. Thanks, Aurelien. Yes, th thank you for your presentation. It's, it's a really fascinating and, and useful project. Uh, but perhaps I have missed something, but I am not sure to understand how you would identify the different types of uh, citation and cross references uh, in the text? Are you using some kind of automatic tools to, to extract this kind of uh, references? So I just would like to, to hear more about this. Uh, yes, we, we use a, 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 a drop down list with the choices uh, of the categories I mentioned from the CETO ontology. There's an ontology for uh, uh, citations. Uh, uh, nature of the citations, I should say, uh, uh, and I can send you the CTO link if you're interested, just let me know. Um, and uh, uh, the links, I could not show you this, unfortunately, because also of the bad connection, uh, but the links have uh, colors, uh, so they're green or blue or what have you, uh, colorblind friendly, uh, so, so you if you scroll through the documents, you can tell the nature of the link. And in the PowerPoint, uh, uh, the edges, the links between different uh, passages or authors are also colored with the nature of the link. And I don't know if, did I address your question correctly or did you mean something else? Yes, in a way, yes, but I was just wondering how you are within the full text, how you're extracting the reference and how you are uh, attributing the references to uh, uh, this is this type of citation or this type of quotation. How, how, how are you finding in the text if there is a reference or not? That was more than uh, what I have in mind. Well, that's on the basis of expert knowledge. And uh, uh, I hope uh, in the future uh, to, uh, if, we if we can obtain uh, further funding, uh, uh, to use artificial intelligence to uh, to filter out candidates uh, for uh, uh, annotation and linking, uh, but that should be a, a next experiment. Uh, and it should always be judged by a human, of course, by a human expert. 
if if the code if it's if it's uh, correct. Thank you. Um, I regret all the technical difficulties, but maybe we have the link and can whatever study those things in detail after the session. Uh, it's time now to uh, continue with the second paper. Jonathan Cogliano is with us in the meantime, and uh, please, Jonathan, it's up to you. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Gonna... Yes. Okay, one second. All right, and the slides are showing up all right? Yes. Yep, okay, great. All right, uh, so uh, I just wanna say thank you for uh, having me. This is great. Uh, I'm excited by the opportunity to present some of this uh, work I've been doing uh, over the past couple of years on the history of this concept known as the core. Um, so the concept of the core, uh, which uh, is one that used to be fairly prominent in work that uh, was done on general equilibrium theory. And when the concept of the core first appeared in the 1960s, it was a, a potential alternative or was an alternative to the first vintage of proofs of existence of general equilibrium. Uh, and this concept of the core uh, originates from cooperative game theory. And it can be a pretty uh, nicely intuitive concept. And I'll just go through it very quickly, um, just in case this is, because uh, it's now somewhat esoteric or obscure. Uh, so I just want to make sure we're, uh, you know, everyone, you know, remembers this because <laughs> it might have been a long time since people have seen it. Um, so the 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 concept is can be pretty intuitive in the sense that if you have a game uh, where there are many participants who can form coalitions to block undesirable outcomes of the game, the core is going to be all kind of feasible uh, allocations or outcomes of the game that no coalition will block. And all of the participants in the game, uh, they can form coalitions of any size. So a coalition can be an individual participant or it can be the coalition of all participants. Now, in stating the core in kind of more, or stating how this idea of the core uh, appears in more explicit economic terms in the way that we've probably seen it before, is these uh, solutions to this game uh, can be considered can be thought of as reallocations of initial endowments that result from market exchange. So allocations in the core uh, are going to be unblocked by any coalition, and they are going to be Pareto optimal. Uh, and it can be shown that the competitive equilibrium is in the core. Now, this is just the standard, uh, you know, relevant portion of the contract curve within the set of mutually beneficial exchanges that we've seen in an Edgeworth box. Uh, but this idea of that this core can contain the competitive equilibrium, uh, this is something that came after the kind of first 1954 uh, proofs of existence of general equilibrium. And I think that there are a few uh, interesting aspects of the story of this concept of the core that uh, point to some kind of bigger issues in the history of economic theory, particularly general equilibrium. So this notion of the core and, um, you know, part of the way or the, how this concept got named is that the story goes something like that, you know, very intuitive, uh, there's a very intuitive demonstration of the concept of the core using the example of an apple, because an apple can be a closed compact set. And you can think of all of the pieces of the apple as the outcomes of a game or, realo or al reallocations of initial endowments, any outcomes or allocations that are gonna be blocked by any coalition get sliced off the fruit and you keep slicing them away until all you have left is the core. And apparently there at one time was even a, uh, a bronze apple core that uh, the econ departments at Stanford and Berkeley used to play for in a uh, football game every year in honor of Arrow and Debrew, even though Arrow never actually worked on 
the core and de Bru, as we'll see only came to do anything uh, involving the core as a result of uh, in you know his interactions with Herbert's scarf. So I think that there's a, there's an interesting story here. Um, this concept of the core uh, was brought to economics by Herbert Scarf, Wood Shapley, and Martin Schubeck. And one of the reasons why they were interested in using this concept or operationalizing it to try to prove, use it as a, an alternative basis for proofs of existence uh, was that it was a more constructive or it was thought to be a more constructive approach to, you know, to general equilibrium because it would allow for a kind of more, uh, it would allow specification of a more behavioral foundation for how one can reach the equilibrium rather than just proving one exists, which is what the 1954 proofs did relying on fixed points. The core also doesn't rely on a fixed point. And this is something that uh, De Bru was pretty interested in after the initial proofs of existence. So the first application of the core to economics is framed by Schubeck in 50, 1959, where he put, puts together a formalization of what's called Edgeworth's conjecture. The idea of Edgeworth's conjecture is that basically as you increase the number of traders in your Edgeworth box up to some large enough number, the core is gonna shrink down to the competitive equilibrium and that's all you have left. Uh, and this is kind of what really interested Scarf and Shapley and Schubeck and drove their efforts to uh, introduce this concept to economics as kind of the next or second vintage of the proofs of existence or uh, you know, a kind of a new way of thinking about general equilibrium. So it's their combined, the combined efforts of these three that brought this concept to economics. However, in the process of working on this, there are actually some differences in perspective that emerged. And what we wind up seeing is two separate contributions. We see a paper by De Bru and Scarf in 63 and Shapley and Schubeck's paper in 66 quite a bit later. Uh, the version of the core that we see in a, a textbook, if it's even covered in a textbook now, is usually based on the De Bru and Scarf 63 paper. Um, and the delay between, or the gap in appearance between De Bru and Scarf and Shapley and Schubeck is something that, uh, you know, I explain in this paper uh, a little bit. Um, so despite all the kind of initial promise that the concept of the core had for economic theory, because you could have a more constructive approach to general equilibrium, you could have a, a prove the equilibrium exists without a fixed point, despite all this promise, the concepts now kind of faded from the canon. This isn't unique to the core, this happens to a lot of different ideas, but I think there's an interesting story in this particular case. So the trajectory of the core, it kind of appears, has a lot of, has a, you know, it's very well received at first, has a kind of strong impact, but then fades uh, somewhat uh, quickly. Uh, this raises a couple primary questions, raises many questions, but there are two primary ones. Uh, so what's the process that kind of brought the core to economics? And if the core was kind of a leap forward, if it satisfied what Debru wanted in terms of a proof without a fixed point, how did it eventually fade away? So I try to answer these two questions, uh, relying on correspondence between Shapley, Schubeck, and Scarf uh, that are that's available in the Herbert Scarf and Martin Schubeck papers in the Economist Papers Archive at Duke. And there's of this correspondence between the three of them, it's a very rich correspondence. Uh, it goes on for many years and it, uh, there's, a, there's a lot in here. So I try to do probably too much in this paper, but it's hard to, hard to resist when you have a come across correspondence that's just contains a lot. Uh, there's a lot happening there. Um, so, you know, I think that the arguably the core is a, con is a concept that suffers from uh, a kind of imagined past where the kind of current practitioners of economics have come up with a story of the core and its place within economic theory to fit later developments in the field. And the, uh, the typical kind of textbook story of the core is usually something like it, 
you know, this was a, an interesting idea, but the notion of competition underlying it is inadequate or unstructured. Um, arrow, and this is consistent across a number of, uh, of texts, uh, you know, kind of targeted at the PhD level uh, economic theory or micro theory courses. And uh, you see something similar in Arrow and Han's treatment of the core where they have a chapter on it, but it's almost treated as a, it's pretty much treated as a digression. Um, Varian's text says it's something that really doesn't conveniently fit with the rest of general equilibrium. And if you actually do a text, if you do a search of the text of Krebs's uh, book, the term doesn't even appear. So this is just kind of to illustrate the kind of current state or give some sense of the current state or economist attitude in general towards this concept. So I think that the role of the core in the development of contemporary modern economic theory is a little understated to say the least. And I think we can understand its impact and eventual decline a little bit better. Uh, it, and this is, Important because I think the core is part of the story of the continued mathematization of economics that starts and really picks up pace in the 1950s. It's also uh, part of the story of the building of the relationship between economics and game theory. And in the case, particular case of the court, this is an, a very early instance of game theory being used to try to address a very big question in economics. And as we know, Game theory in economics doesn't really firmly take hold until quite a bit later in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so I think this is actually well before that. And the typical game theory that we know now is also the non-cooperative game theory. And the core comes originates from the cooperative game theory being done at Princeton in the 1950s. Uh, and also, uh, so far, uh, we have the histories of general equilibrium have focused quite a bit on the first vintage of the proofs of existence, and there isn't uh, quite as much attention on the next generation or next, uh, next generation of uh, economic theorists working on GE or on the next kind of, uh, you know, vintages of the, uh, this class of models. And one other thing that was, we see that emerges in this correspondence between uh, Scarf, Shapley, and Schubert is that uh, there's an, the issue of non-convexity comes up and actually plays, I think, a pretty important role in their discussions and I think plays a role in the eventual attitudes that people, especially Scarf and Schubert, wind up having towards the core later in their careers, and hopefully I'll have time to talk about that. So as I uh, already mentioned, the core uh, is uh, traces its roots to cooperative game theory that uh, came out of Princeton in the 1950s. And it's a pretty, con the concept is a pretty close descendant of the, of what we see in von Neumann and Morgenstern. Uh, even though Scarf, Shapley, and Schubert worked on the core, uh, sorry, sorry, Scarf, Shapley, and Schubert all did their PhDs at Princeton. Um, Schubert was the only one in the econ department where he was supervised by Oscar Morgenstern, and Scarf and Shapley were both uh, in the math department at Princeton. They all knew each other. Uh, Shapley and Schubert, as you know, famously were sweet mates with John Nash and uh, all of that, but um, they all knew each other from Princeton. Scarf wasn't as close to Shapley and Schubert or um, the others in that kind of well-known suite with John Nash, but he knew them and was very friendly with them. Uh, but the work between these three on developing the concept of the core in economics happened well after their time at Princeton. But despite that, uh, the Princeton does serve as kind of pretty relevant context for, the, uh, for their work and the development of this idea. Um, and as we know, early in the early on in uh, the 1950s, as Princeton was kind of becoming a center for work in game theory, uh, game theory wasn't very well received by economics initially. Uh, and it took quite some time before it became firmly embedded in uh, the canon of economic knowledge. And so during this time in the 1950s, uh, kind of as 
Shapley, Schubert, and Scarf were all finishing up their time at Princeton in the early mid to mid 1950s. They were kind of talking about these concepts, but not really getting at how they how the concept of the core could be used in economics. So it doesn't come till quite a bit later, starting in 1960, that they uh, start to really put all this together. So the first instance we have of an attempt to formalize a relationship between the concept of the core and implement it in uh, or app, apply it to comp the competitive equilibrium is in Schubick's uh, this conference paper by Schubick in 1959. Uh, this paper is, is fairly limited in terms of it just works with a, a too good model with many consumers. And he also uses transferable utility, or he puts the whole thing together using side payments. Um, the typical presentation of the core that we might see today is usually based on the 63 paper by Debru and Scarf. So I think there's a question here of, well, why not the 59 paper by Schubeck? And we have a few answers here. It's limited by the use of transferable utility. This is something that economists at the time and even now are uh, pretty opposed to. Uh, it's not something that we generally regard as, or is generally regarded as being. Um, sound. And uh, this is also something that the limits of transferable utility and the fact that it's so closely associated with cooperative game theory, uh, this is something that Schubert later kind of laments that he's a little disappointed that cooperative game theory wound up being limited by this and people were more on board with the notion of transferable utility. <clears throat> the next a uh, version of the core in economics that we see is then a conference paper by Scarf in 62. And uh, in this paper, he notes that conversations with Shapley and Schubert are uh, really what brought his, his brought the core to his attention. And he even notes that it's really based, they've discussed this so much, it's really hard to separate his contributions from theirs, and he gives them a great deal of credit for a lot of what's in the 62 paper. The results of the 62 paper are eventually combined with a note that Debru writes in 63, and then later appear as the combined publication with Debru and Scarf. And in that 63 note by Debru, he even credits Scarf for his interest in the subject of the core uh, entirely. So we have some gaps in the story here. Uh, so we have the first appearance in 59. We have another one, another appearance in 62. We have the publication of what is kind of the, you know, canonical version in 63. But then we have Shapley Schubick's version appearing much later in 66. So, uh, and we have some reference to some conversations between these three people that ex are, you know, seem to be pretty important based on the notes and acknowledgments in these papers. So uh, luckily, we have access to this correspondence and we can this the correspondence between Scarf, Shapley and Schubert really helps to fill in a lot of these gaps. And we also have the correspondence between Scarf and Debru in Scarf's papers. Um, so despite the kind of different appearances of this uh, version of the core, despite the fact that three these three started working together and then eventually published separately there's no issue of credit they all kind of readily give each other credit and uh praise each other for this there's no real issue there but um it's helpful to fill in the gaps here because i think this tells the story about why the core was at first important and then helps to also illustrate how it eventually disappeared now the Conversations about the core begin in 1960 with, and as Scarf and Schubert recounted in firsthand accounts, they say it began with a walk from Columbia to downtown New York, uh, to downtown New York City in October of 1960. And they got to this apart an apartment where Shapley was there waiting. Um, Shapley kept very strange hours and he apparently had just woken up from a nap or something like that in the middle of the day. And they all got started working on this immediately and apparently stayed up till about 5.30 in the morning talking about the uh, how to show that, that the core could be used to prove uh, the general equilibrium. Almost immediately, the issue of, sorry. Sorry, Jonathan, your, your time is spent, you know. OK, I'm going to just two things. I'll wrap up real quick. Um, so 
the um I should just stop here then because it's yeah I just mismanaged my time I apologize uh, maybe you come up with a short summary or conclusion okay I'll come up with a short summary um so the short very short the shortest version of this is that there's a, a series of conversations that happen between uh Scarf Shapley and Schubick in 1960 the they begin their conversations the issue of transferable utility comes up almost right away Scarf doesn't kind of understand why they're so focused on this and why it's um why it should be why Scar why Schubick and Shapley are so fixated on the notion um, so the di differences in opinion or perspective are kind of there from the start, but they kind of get intensified as the correspondence goes on uh, through 1960 to 1961. Um, and they also start bringing up the issues of non-convexity pretty early on as well. Uh, by the end of 1961, Scarf isn't convinced by Schubert and Shapley on the need for including transferable utility in the, in the proof of existence. So he starts communicating with De Bruy and approaches is De Bruy about a joint publication. De Bruy is not says there sh they shouldn't have. He kind of rules out a joint publication from the start because he thinks Scarf's contribution or his discovery is just so wonderful that um, the there's just no their contributions are so out of proportion. Their De Bruy's name should not be attached to it. And Scarf makes a couple attempts to try to get De Bruy on board with the joint publication. De Bruy kind of politely refuses a couple times, but we do eventually see the joint publication in 63. The issue of non-convexity also comes up in a separate conversation between Shapley and Schubert that's happening alongside uh, the Scarf De Bruy correspondence. And uh, the take on non-convexity is pretty different. Scarf's interested in non-convexity in terms of having increasing returns to scale uh, in a production for producers. Schubick thinks that the relevance of non-convexity is that if you have non-convexity and preferences, money can help to smooth non-convexities and you can still have a general equilibrium. Um, so they kind of go on their separate ways about the, with this. Sh Shabik, uh, sorry, uh, Shapley and Schubick um, have a lot of difficulty getting their paper published because they stick to inclu uh, including transferable utility. It takes quite some time and not until 66 that the paper eventually appears. And it's because, uh, you know, Strauss is the editor of Econometrica at the time and is ready to, you know, kind of after a couple rounds of refereeing that take a couple years, he eventually accepts the paper. And um, that's where we wind up with the 66 paper. Um, overall, all told, the uh, the issue that the, the way that um, non convexity comes up, I think, plays an important role in the attitudes that Scarf and Schubert, in particular, have later on towards the concept of the core. Um, we know as the core appears initially, generally, the general equilibrium research program seems to be on the upswing. We have proofs without fixed points. There's a lot of extensions that can be made, and the program kind of takes off from there. Uh, but the core kind of disappears eventually, and usually this is, can be attributed to uh, the shifting interests of game theorists and economic theorists towards non-cooperative game theory and the general fizzling of the broad general equilibrium research program based on Sonnenschein, Mantel, and De Bruy. But this story is kind of insufficient because the issue of non-convexity uh, for Scarf and Schubick, I think, plays a role, in, especially in the case of Scarf. Um, as we know, after work, his work on the core, Scarf, uh, the next phase of his research was on the computation of equilibrium. And this is, again, partly influenced by his interest in a constructive approach to equilibrium, but it's also because he really thought that it, um, he was just really unconvinced by the reliance on convex production sets that uh, microeconomic theory typically relied on. And so this was a big driving issue for him that um, we had to figure out how to handle increasing returns to scale. And he even discovered in 63, as he's working on the paper with De Bruy, that if you have increasing returns to scale, you can have a non-empty core, but no competitive equilibrium exists. And he wrote this discussion paper in 63, and it didn't appear until 86. 
Um, so there's quite a gap in time here. And I'm just going to end with this really quick quote here. Um, uh, apologies. Um, so he said, I think this captures his views and kind of the overall uh, fills in this gap in the story that I've presented here, where Scarf says, in publishing this paper so many years after its writing, I'm offering a public argument my, for my reluctantly acquired feelings that a replacement for the Valrasian model incorporating economies of large scale production cannot be based on the concepts of cooperative game theory. This is a very kind of, uh, you know, sad outcome or unfortunate outcome from Scarf's perspective. And I think the store issue of non-convexity, problems of increasing returns, and then for Schubert, the problems of money and general equilibrium uh, play background roles in the eventual kind of decline of the concept of the core and the general equilibrium, general equilibrium research program that maybe deserve a little more attention. Thank you so much. Do we have questions or comments? I have two comments, if I may. Please. We just yeah, have thank four minutes left. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Fascinating talk. Uh, two uh, remarks which I find quite important. One is that Scarf actually began with his uh, constructive approach earlier by constructing a counterexample in the stability theory. And that might have been another um, uh, motivation to switch from uh, the differential equation story to cooperative uh, games. And the second is that I would, I would be very careful in formulating this, that game theorists moved from cooperative games to non-cooperative games. They had a powerful tool, which was called the Nash program, Nash 1953, the bargaining solution in which cooperative elements and all ideas connected to coalitions and things like that played a significant role. That was a very important part in the game theory and the history of game theory. And we should not forget about that. Uh, yeah, these are two short remarks. Thank you. And the answer is? Yeah, so uh, yeah, points are the points are well taken. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's right. So Scarf did, you know, he does have his exact counter examples on the potential instability of equilibrium that do happen before he works on the core. And I, that is kind of his introduction to a lot of economics uh, is his work on that, where he uh, starts out uh, being introduced to general equilibrium by Arrow and, and Hurwitz in particular, and Uzawa. So yeah, I should, uh, yeah, that just need to be kind of real, uh, you know, highlighted a little bit more. And I think it's right that it does influence Scarf's um, desire or kind of the main, uh, you know, effort over his career to have this constructive approach. That's something that was there from the beginning as well, at least in his own Kind of autobiographical writings he talks about always being interested in that um yeah and i i'll um i should shore up the language about the shift uh, to non-cooperative versus cooperative that's yeah um thank you if no further question is coming up we can conclude the second paper and i had a question i was just trying a to couple raise hands yeah Please do. Yes, can I? Um, yes, my question. I, I wanted to know how uh, you see Lester Telser's work on the core fitting into all of this. I noticed in your paper you he's in the bibliography, but I didn't find anything about him. I was a graduate student at Chicago in the 1970s, and he was doing a lot of stuff in the core. Some people viewed him as kind of quixotic, but others viewed him as totally brilliant. And I was just wondering about how his work fit into all this stuff. Yeah, so I think um, uh, in kind of evaluating things, looking back, uh, he is one of these people who maintains uh, that the core is still a really important and really relevant concept, even after a whole bunch of other people, almost everybody else has kind of abandoned it. Um, and I, that is that is interesting uh, because he has the uh, he has pieces in 
very, very recently compared to, you know, their first appearances of the core uh, showing this. Um, and uh, it's, I didn't treat Telser fully in this paper because he does come after this initial, you know, first generation of the core theorists of Scarf, Shapley, and Schubeck. Um, but I think uh, there could be quite a bit of interesting uh, material there to, you know, treat Telser, uh, you know, fully by himself even, or, you know, place him in the continuum that comes after this initial appearance of the core. Okay, last question by Stephen Medema, please. There we go. Uh, D David, the answer to your question is he was brilliant and quixotic both. Um, is it possible that um, you know, this sort of what happened to it history that you're tracking has something to do with how people handled the core? And maybe this just reflects my own experience with, with the thread of that literature. But, but a lot of the core stuff I've seen is about showing that a core doesn't exist or that the core is empty. That is, it's not a very sort of constructive, progressive sort of thing. And, and might that account for why people began to very quickly minimize its import? Yeah, I think that that's probably right. Um, that you do, after this, the 63, 66 papers, towards the end of the 60s, um, or the middle of the from the mid '60s up towards the early 1970s, uh, you do see quite a few contributions using the core, where the you have a negative conclusion that the core is empty, and I think that this does undermine the the kind of the wish that somebody like Scarf had from the outset that we have a very constructive approach to economic theory to equilibrium and. Um, so I think that that does that definitely does play a factor, and that's that's something that I'm trying to talk to some of the people who were involved in that kind of next wave, the first kind of generation of students of people like Scarf, Shapley, and Schubeck, um, to see what they think about this. So that's kind of something I've planned for the next phase of this research, and I think that that is that definitely does play a role. That if you have just negative conclusions, that I, how can yeah I, th I think that does really undermine the progression of a program research program built around an idea like this okay thank you now it's up to me to continue with my own paper uh so i just have to check how can i upload it uh okay Okay, the title of my paper is Boundaries of Economy. Uh, I would not have chosen this title um, knowing before that it was just um, uh, the title of a symposium published in the Journal of History of Economic Thought uh, in June now, which I haven't read. I just saw it right now. So um, it's a bit uh, maybe um, raising some different associations. Um, my paper is less concerned with um, individual authors, as so many papers here, but more with an attempt to look over the decades of development in economics, especially the second half of the 20th century. And it has very much to do with what um, Richard Vandenberg mentioned previously as enormous output of uh, publications. Um, I think that is um, uh, somehow a merit, but also a problem of development of economics. Um, so uh, where does economics come, economics come from and where does it seemingly go? Um, this um, Quo Vadis perspective uh, leads somehow my uh, paper. Um, Josef Schumpeter in his history of economic analysis raised the question, but is economics a science? And he concluded that the answer is almost dependent upon the answer to the question what science is at all. Without doubt, economics is part of the social sciences and differs from formal or natural sciences. Um, 
and this for several reasons. Nevertheless, there can be no doubt about the recent status of economics as a science. However, economics is not and never has been a homogeneous body uh, with a firm canon of knowledge, methods, paradigmatic worldviews and topics. And it is analogous to other sciences as well in a permanent dynamic flux of evolution, modification, overwriting, and replacement of earlier positions by newer ones. Additionally, we find a broad variety uh, of different approaches, theories, and applications of economics as the dichotomic um, confrontation of orthodox versus heterodox economics um, is just an illustration, also not too helpful. Um, these uh, opposing positions can be found already since the beginning of the 20th century, but it serves more as a marking, as marking different academic camps rather than being a helpful perspective to classify and organize the common stock of knowledge. Nowadays, we find seemingly trends which indicate a reintegration of history, psychology, and um, maybe also um, uh, sociology into economics, or at least of arguments and intentions to do so. As a question of what is the subject of economics has a long a tradition. The often quoted statement uh, by Jacob Weiner, uh, economics is what economists do, was completed already by Frank Knight when he added, and economists are those who do economics. Looking at activities of economists shows that the domain of economics is always in tradition. Since no clear borders exist that provide rational marks for the area of economics, even the current understanding of the discipline is not more advanced than at the times of Weiner or Knight. The multiplicity of academic production um, is um, or, or mirrors uh, um, different problems which we have to, um, to decide what economics really is. Of course, the 20th century was largely the century of the evolution and revival of neoclassical economics based upon earlier forms of marginal uh, utility theory. However, um, uh, what, what then has happened since uh, the starting of neoclassical uh, theory uh, is um, that uh, we have um, a multiplication of, uh, of, of, of different applications of economics, which was already, um, and the decoupling of, his, of, of economics, history, and sociology, uh, which was already by Max Weber mentioned uh, early uh, in the 20th century in his uh, famous a talk about um, science as profession, where he said uh, uh, the, 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 the feature of current uh, um, scientific development is specialization and differentiation, not only externally, but inwardly. Matters stand at a point where the individual can acquire the sure consciousness of achieving um, truly um, of achieving something truly perfect in the field of science only in case he's a strict specialist. Um, and, and Parsons and Smeltzer 50 years later concluded only few authors being competent in sociological theory have any working knowledge of economics and conversely, few economists have much knowledge of sociology. So what is the current status is if one is studying in any field, academic field, one has to go deeper and deeper and deeper and to neglect the broadness of development. And um, uh, that give, may give an illustration. Uh, I, I called it once the pedigree of social sciences. Um, all these different academic um, fields did not exist 100 years ago. Uh, we have here economics and social psychology, sociology, political science, communication studies, history. That was uh, all under one roof 100 or 150 years ago as economics including law organization and history and so on. And then you, we had these, um, um, this specialization into the two branches of business administration or management. And that what we still mean with economics and much more. And, and very often uh, you really survive only if you have a very specific niche, history of economic thought, by the way, is one of the niches. Uh, anyway, I would like to go on. 
uh, in the 100 or 150 years ago, we just had one, let's say, uh, science which was relevant to economics. And then you all had this, this spectrum of new disciplines. I mean, the, the link between economics and mathematics uh, is now full of life. And we have just uh, with the presentation of Jonathan so, uh, seen this, this link between um, mathematics, game theory and economics. And one could really uh, add a lot of stuff on that. Uh, and there was also the Nobel laureate for economics to a mathematician like, uh, like Nash. Um, that is also what new students uh, which uh, decide to enter a study, university study of economics have to learn firstly. Um, they have uh, to invest into mathematics, statistics, econometrics, and so on. But there are also links to other uh, branches. If you go to philosophy, psychology, history, maybe also to law. I, I have not the time to spell out all those links, but philosophy may be uh, that was uh, the link between economics and uh, people uh, like Amitai Shen who got the Nobel Prize and he's still a professor in economics and the department of philosophy. So all related to the moral issues or Sandel at Harvard um, and, 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 and former times it was uh, Friedrich von Hayek um, that was full of life, and it is maybe still a bit uh, in, 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 in fashion when you think about the Oxford model of PPE, politics, philosophy, and economics. Um, then we have the link between economics and psychology, and you see that at least uh, during the last years, uh, three, no uh, three Nobel Prizes for economics were awarded to psychologists, um, which were... Um, uh, 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 bounded rationality, um, um, Herbert Simon, Daniel Kahneman, and later Richard Thaler. Um, and, and you could also whatever to see the links to law, geography, and, and maybe sociology. I, I just would like to indicate it is a multi-complex uh, figuration and spectrum of diverse association. Eleanor Ostrom also who got a Nobel uh, 15 years ago, she was writing about the troika of economic sociology and political science. Uh, that is a nice wording, uh, but maybe troika is a bit too less. We should maybe also include uh, other sciences, let's say history and let's say um, psychology to have a quartet or quintet at least. And then we come to this um, overlapping circles between economics, psychology, sociology and history. Um, I mean, I was already talking about three psychology, uh, three uh, representatives of psychology who were um, classified as uh, as economists when they got the Nobel Prize in, in economics. Uh, Daniel Kahneman is more or less uh, um, treated as um, as the uh, founder of behavioral economics. Um, and um, it is a firm branch within economics in the meantime. Uh, history, and, and that is the name also of our session here, uh, historiography, um, that has become also very popular. Uh, uh, Fogel got a Nobel Prize on this, this studies about um, slaveholder societies in the 18th century, but you can also go to institutional economics, uh, starting with uh, Douglas uh, North or others. He, uh, they do nothing else than looking back historically to see uh, the long past developments of the evolution of, um, of societies and the scientific system. So um, features of neoclassic thought were at the beginning as uh, the general equilibrium, as uh, a model as the idea of the homo economicus and all, peer, all people share the same information. And uh, what has happened since then, all the recent top guys uh, in, in economics being awarded with the most prestigious prizes are uh, somehow against one or the other of those assumptions. But what they do is criticizing models of neoclassic thoughts, which are trends towards abstractness and formalism. So uh, we are arguing in favor of more cultural and historical perspectives uh, to apply. That was a credo by Robert Solow already 25 years ago when he said, all narrowly economic activities embedded in a web of social institutions, customs, beliefs, and attitudes. 
few things should be more interesting to a civilized economic theorist than the opportunity to, um, to observe the interplay between social institutions and economic behavior over time and place. And that is really the interesting thing, um, over time and place. And if we take it seriously, then we um, can apply a distinction which I found in the 30s by Werner Sombart, who, whom I found discussed and mentioned just today here at the conference several times. Uh, he decided or he, uh, he introduced the um, uh, the distinction between economies in abstracto versus economies in concreto. Just economies in concreto really ask for time, for space, for culture. So the applications of concrete economies, uh, because the neoclassic thought was uh, to come up with, 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 with models, with ideas and theorems about economies in abstracto, to, so to find out the general rules, how capitalism uh, evolves and is working and functioning. Whereas now economies in concreto or theorists about economies in concreto ask more for the differences of uh, concrete uh, capitalist systems. So capitalism, let's say in Canada, uh, differs from, uh, let's say, um, capitalism in, 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 uh, in Congo or capitalism in South Korea. So these are different models and all are requiring time, space and culture matter, or let's say um, uh, history matters and uh, including all those cultural models involved in history. And that is, uh, let's say something which was introduced uh, by Douglas North, the time and changing rules of the game. North, uh, North said once, improving our understanding of the nature of, um, economic change entails that we draw on the only laboratory that we have, which is the past. So in other words, as curious as it may sound, we have to invest into the past and to research about the past to get an understanding of current problems or to have an idea about potential passes for the future. That was, uh, let's say, um, the idea of, of Douglas North. And, um, and the other against Homo economicus was all this bounded rationality a program introduced by Simon, continued by, by Kahneman and uh, also Richard Tagler, uh, Thaler. Um, why do people do what they do? And um, that is behavioral economics, I said it already, and that is taken up by recent prominent uh, representatives of the American Economic Association, especially Akolov. He did a presidential address uh, 10 years ago where he said motivation. Motivation is a missing link, which is so important for economists uh, to, to get acknowledged. We really have to, to ask for the, for the, for the, for the driving uh, power which people invest to arrive at their goals and uh, to motivate for work and uh, for entrepreneurial activities or whatever. So. Um, that is um, something which opens up, let's say, the classic previous core of economics into the links to um, social psychology, maybe also to anthropology and eth ethnology, maybe also to sociology. And um, what is um, the result of that? That we have today a coexistence of former textbook knowledge as mainstream economics. And at the same time, we have radical innovations and changes within the field. So if a student comes if, uh, uh, and starts with the first semester, uh, trying to learn to know uh, something about economics, uh, mostly they will really, really be confronted, still confronted with textbook knowledge, with the classic neoclassic neo economics, stuff and those curves of uh, supply and demand and so on. And um, where um, the, the, the most prominent representatives awarded by, let's say the Nobel prizes do quite different stuff. They would never really uh, do something which uh, first semester students will learn as a textbook. What we do have and what we can observe 
is a reintegration of economics in the world in the wide field of universal social sciences. So I have called it in a publication in the Journal of Economic Issues a few years ago, we have a social scientification of economics. So that is a reintegration of economics uh, or opening up towards, let's say, history, psychology, and, uh, and some others, Expect, except um, the, the link to uh, mathematics and, 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 um, and econometrics. That is another pair of shoes. But in the others, we have more in, in ongoing integration. And all that social embeddedness already mentioned by Solo in the 80s of social behavior in institutions means we have to ask for culture studies and sociology if culture matters, sociology, and I should explicitly say also history matters. And yeah, and that is more or less uh, the content of my paper. Um, I, I, I really try to, uh, to find some um, general or oval lines of the, of the development of the course of, um, of 20th, 20th century, which is in one sentence, on the one hand, multiplication and differentiation um, of stuff and people and journals and publications in general on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have um, um, also a shift um, to, um, to, to new domains which not have even um, existed uh, 30 or 40 years ago and at least not at the beginning of the 20th century. Thank you so much. So oh, um, maybe somebody else can take. Um, now I have to moderate myself, uh, or somebody else I can, can do. I can I can moderate if, if, you, you, if you want. Yeah, uh, I can do that. If there is any question or comment at all. We can give people another a minute to think of it. Oh, Steve has one. Yeah, perhaps it's an artifact of the presentation format rather than having a paper to look at. But I'm I'm trying to to understand the historical question that you're trying to get at here. Um, is your are you trying to sort of tease out how other social sciences have influenced economics and the way economists look at problems in recent years or, or, or where exactly are you going with this? And, and I ask because uh, uh, Fleet Fontaine um, and Roger Backhouse have a large ongoing project that looks at, at some of these issues. Uh, in concert with other historians of social science? Uh, yes, yes and no. I mean, that is not really my question. Um, of course, you have also those, 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 those topic inside of my talk uh, where, where you may ask how domains are extended in economics. That was, let's say, uh, the initial attempt by, by, by Gary Becker, extending the boundaries of economics to known economic phenomena, like, like uh, which restaurants do people visit, or uh, how do you plan your family, and all those. Uh, that was whatever, the, all this is, um, is quoted or also somehow criticized under the flag of imperialism of economics. That is not really, uh, that is not only my and my, con my, my concern or my topic. My topic is much more um, um, that there is not a very unique and very broad um, um, field, uh, a, a very sterile uh, field and development and, and, and path of economics anymore, but that we have a multiplicity of different forms of theoretical and applied economics where it is really a difficult 
to say uh, what is um, at the end economics anymore, or it, it has become increasingly everything and nothing. Um, and it has in some way also in an in increasing integration with psychology, with history, and with, um, with, with some further um, academic disciplines. That is something I try to whatever to transport and to um, to look at. I'm not sure if it is clear. I mean, I see, I see somehow. Yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't talking about the Becker stuff. I was talking about the antithesis of that. That is, economists using not economists attempting to do work in other social science areas so much as increasingly using ideas and tools and methods from other social sciences to inform economics research, um, which is a, a topic that's that's been hugely underanalyzed. Um, there's been plenty of analysis of, of the imperialism stuff, um, but, but, but rather the, the, the reverse. Um, because economists are so often seen as being out there on an island just doing their own thing. And to the extent they're doing other things, attempting to colonize other disciplines with economic methods, but there, there's actually a, a fairly rich recent history to be, to be written of how economists have drawn on the insights of other social science fields in various ways to uh, enhance, shall we say, economic inquiry. Which, which does get to the point uh, I think that you, you you mentioned about okay so what what is distinctly economics you know um, in 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 a sense versus say you know Erwin de Brew, you know 1950 whatever That is not the only point I have. Uh, it's also, if you look at historiography, you see very much um, uh, development uh, that it is um, under the flag of economics, sometimes more historical research, what is going on. And if a person like, like Fogel is getting a Nobel Prize for economics, also he's just doing re research on the history of slaveholder societies in the 18th century, that is really remarkable. So that shows, um, uh, economics is not or has not been or be, uh, has not is not any more the same as it maybe was 50 years ago and, uh, and many many other topics more let's say um, social and economic inequality um, uh, let, let, let's see that 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 um, that an author like Piketty gets so much attraction in the whole world that many many uh, national economic societies, put him as a, as a credo or slogan of the annual conferences in the, in the last years. Um, but that is more or less um, also in the same way, uh, let's say sociological stuff. Uh, and, and, and you could add so many things where, um, where the domains are really mixing up and, and where they are newly configuring. So there are new developments which are not really worked out and not really perceived well. Um, uh, also, you have an integration or a revival of old institutional uh, in, uh, old uh, institutionalism and uh, and closing or, or handshake between old institutionalism and new institutionalism, which did not exist or which was unthinkable in in, in, in times of uh, of the development of neoclassic economics. Uh, so even there, you see strong. Uh, links to cultural sciences, to sociology, to history. So I think that the borders of economics are getting increasingly getting fluid and and unclear and gray, and and, and that is more or less my my topic. And in clear opposite to that, uh, we can observe the situation that um, that 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 our teaching of economics differs very much, which is still. Uh, oriented in, in textbooks, which were more or less the same uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago.
I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. So by my clock, we've about a minute left. Are there any other uh, quick comments or questions? No. Okay. Uh, so I think. Jonathan, so you can you can speak the concluding words. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, thank you everybody to our, to our presenters and uh, all of our attendees and uh, for the comments and feedback um, so I think that's, that's it for our session right um, <laughs> thank you so much bye bye thank you